Chapter 2 Troll Skull Alley Troll Skull Alley is filled with people who can shape the characters' day to day lives in Waterdeep. The characters will likely return to Troll Skull Alley many times during the adventure and get to know their neighbours as time passes. The locations described here are keyed into the map of Troll Skull Alley. Buildings not specifically identified on the map are row houses that serve as private residences for upper middle class water Davians who can afford housekeepers, groundskeepers and nannies. Area T1 Troll Skull Manor Give a copy of this handout to your players as the characters begin to explore Troll Skull Manor. Four stories tall and boasting balconies, a turret and five chimneys the abandoned building is one of the grandest in Trollskull Alley. Characters can refurnish, rebuild, rename, and otherwise personalize their new stronghold to their heart's content. Tavern Rooms When the characters first arrive, the tavern's tap room is filled with broken furniture, tarnished silverware, casks of wine that have turned to vinegar, and worthless detritus. The tavern's other rooms are all empty except for cobwebs, dust, and harmless rats. Spirit on Tap The former tavern is haunted by the poltergeist or spectre of the tavern's previous barkeeper, a half-elf named Leaf. Maintaining the tavern was his life's work, and he couldn't abandon the place in death. The poltergeist understands common and elvish, but it can't speak. It invisibly causes mischief at the expense of the new owners by smashing plates, breaking beer barrels, and so forth. If the characters don't take the hint, it writes not-so-subtle warnings such as CLOSING TIME and LAST CALL on dusty floors and grimy windows. To truly claim the tavern as their own, the characters must either appease the poltergeist or destroy it. Appeasing Leaf If the characters work to repair and renovate the tavern with the goal of opening it to the public again, the poltergeist begins to accept them as the new owners and gradually becomes quite accommodating. Pulling out a chair when the character wants to sit down, pouring a beer and delivering it to the character, taking coats when folks come in from the rain, and so forth. Once the business is up and running, Leaf can also perform other helpful functions, such as locking doors, sweeping floors, and so forth. Destroying Leaf Leaf's poltergeist is destroyed if its hit points are reduced to zero, if attacked, it flees to the uppermost levels of the turret when reduced to half its hit points. From there, it fights until the bitter end. Area T2 The Bent Nail A small wooden sign above the shop's main door is bare except for a large bent nail sticking out of it. The front room contains displays of ornate wooden furniture, as well as a selection of bows and crossbows. The wall behind the counter is lined with a row of finely carved wooden canes, quarterstaffs, and shields. Tully Silvana, Tally Fellbranch, the owner and chief artisan of the Bent Nail, is a male half-elf carpenter and a woodcarver. He is a commoner with these changes. Tally is chaotic good. He has these racial traits. He has advantage on saving throws against being charmed, and magic can't put him to sleep. He has dark vision out to a range of 60 feet. He speaks common and elvish. Services Tally sells wooden weapons and shields at normal cost. He also crafts and sells furniture and wooden sculptures. Area T3 Steam and Steel During daylight hours, smoke and steam billow out of the many windows around this indoor forge where metal weapons, armor, and tools are made. The forge is owned and operated by a married couple, a fire genasi named Embrick and a water genasi named Avai. Both are members of the most cared order of skilled smiths and metal forges. As an armorer, Avai also belongs to the splendid order of armorers, locksmiths, and vinesmiths. Embrick tends the forge and is an expert weaponsmith. He claims descent from the Efreet of Kalamshan and is prone to extreme mood swings. He has the statistics of a bandit captain with these changes. Embrick is neutral good. He has these racial traits. He can cast Produce Flame at will. Constitution is his spellcasting ability, and he has a plus 4 bonus to hit with spell attacks. He has Dark Vision out to a range of 60 feet, and resistance to fire damage. He speaks Common and Primordial. 
Avi worships Eldeth, god of peace, and uses his magic to quench hot steel. He's an expert armorsmith. Avi is laid back and speaks plainly. He has the statistics of a priest with these changes. Avi is neutral good. He has these racial traits. At will, he can control the flow and shape of water in a five-foot cube, or cause water to freeze for up to one hour. He has a swimming speed of 30 feet, and he can breathe air and water. He has resistance to acid damage. He speaks common and primordial. Services The Genasi couple sell all metal weapons, armor, and shields listed in Chapter 5 of the Player's Handbook at normal cost. Area T4 Corellian's Crown Fala La Falia, a herbalist and a member of the Guilds of Apothecaries and Physicians, operates out of this stately three-story townhouse, the third floor of which has been converted to a greenhouse. Its translucent glass walls allow anyone on the street to see the rainbow of flowers blossoming from within. Fala La Falia is an outgoing wood elf with long braided hair, like the elven god Corellian Letharian. Fala is neither male nor female. If preferred to as he or she, Fala gently requests to be addressed by name or as they. Fala is friends with a member of the Zentarum named Zaraj, who saved Fala's life. He visits Fala from time to time, and Fala set aside a room for him on the second floor. Fala is a druid with these changes. Fala is chaotic good. Fala has these racial traits. Fala has advantage on saving throws against being charmed, and magic can't put Fala to sleep. Fala has a walking speed of 35 feet and dark vision out to a range of 60 feet. Fala speaks common, druidic, and elvish. Services In addition to non-magical herbal remedies, Fala sells potions of the types listed in the Fala's potion table. Fala keeps 1d6 vials of each potion in locked cabinets behind the shop counter. Fala's Potions Potion of Animal Friendship 125 gold pieces Potion of Climbing 50 gold pieces Potion of Greater Healing 250 gold pieces Potion of Healing 50 gold pieces Potion of Water Breathing 250 gold pieces Area T5 Tiger's Eye This private detective's business is unremarkable on the outside its only distinguishing mark is an orange and black sign featuring a cat's eye. Inside is a regal apartment dimly lit by flickering oiled lamps. The door is locked, and visitors must knock or ring the bell before being let in. They are met by Vincent Trench, a human detective and the owner of Tiger's Eye. He speaks concisely, dresses in a sharp suit, and smokes a slim pipe. Vincent is in fact a Raksasha named Valatajar that always casts a sky self on itself before seeing visitors. Raksasha has lived in Waterdeep for years, switching identities as often as it needs to keep its true nature hidden. It has grown accustomed to living amongst mortals, and, much to its own astonishment, is rather fond of Waterdeep and its citizens. Services Trench can discover any secret in Waterdeep for a fee. Use your judgement when pricing its services. 50 gold pieces is sufficient for most investigations, but if the characters want to learn secrets relating to the major antagonists of this adventure, the Raksasha might require a service in payment, such as slaying enemies that are hunting it, posting advertisements for its businesses in the tavern, or keeping tabs on someone that Vincent has been hired to spy on. Area T6 Bookworm's Treasure the front of this bookstore is adorned with a charming sign of a golden dragon curled around a treasure hoard of books and scrolls. Inside, the shop is decorated by beautiful hardwood, and the earthy scents of old books permeates the air. The library fills two floors of this three-story building, and it somehow seems to contain more shelves than the building should be able to hold. The shop is managed by a short dragonborn of gold dragon ancestry named Rishal, the page-turner, who lives on the third floor. Rishal, a member of the watchful order of mages and protectors, is a mage with these changes. Rishal is neutral. He has these racial traits. He can use his action to exhale a 15-foot cone of fire, but can't do this again until he finishes a short or long rest. Each creature in the cone must make a DC-10 dexterity saving throw, 
taking 2d6 fire damage on a failed save, or half as much damage on a successful one. He has resistance to fire damage. He speaks common, draconic, dwarvish, and elvish. Services The shop contains books of all sorts. In addition, Rochal has a small collection of spell books and allows wizards to copy spells from them at the cost listed in the spells for sale table. He can scribe any of these spells as a spell scroll, but charges twice the listed cost for this service. Spells for Sale Comprehend languages, detect magic, featherfall, find familiar, mage armor, magic missile, shield and unseen servant can be purchased for 25 gold pieces. Arcane Lock Continual Flame, Dark Vision, Invisibility, Magic Weapon, Misty Step, Rope Trick, and Suggestion can be purchased for 75 gold pieces. Clairvoyance, Counterspell, Dispel Magic, Fireball, Fly, Non-Detection, and Water Breathing can be purchased for 150 gold pieces. Arcane Eye, Fabricate, Greater Invisibility, Ice Storm, Locate Creature, and Polymorph can be purchased for 300 gold pieces. Bigsby's Hand, Cone of Cold, and Modify Memory can be purchased for 750 gold pieces. Area T7, The Sewer Access At the end of Trollskull Alley is a removable metal grate that covers an opening. Below the grate, a ladder descends 20 feet into the water-deep sewer system. Joining Factions Word begins to spread throughout Waterdeep that a group of adventurers helped Volothem Gadam and rescued Rainier Neverember. Within days, faction representatives begin to approach the characters and try to recruit them. This book's introduction describes the various factions and what they look for in recruits. The characters need not join the same faction, and some might not want to join a faction at all. A character who belongs to a faction is given a mission upon gaining a level, from 2nd through to 5th level. Completing the mission increases that member's renown in the faction. Other characters who aren't faction members can assist in the mission's completion. A character who belongs to a faction other than the Lord's Alliance can turn down a mission without consequence. Each faction has a representative who serves as its primary contact. This non-player character delivers mission briefings and dispenses the tangible rewards for completing a mission. An increase in renown quickly follows. The missions and the manner in which they can be completed are described in the tables throughout this section. You can use missions from these tables or replace them with any ones of your own creation. If a mission ends in failure, the character can try again after 24 hours, unless the failure has created circumstances where doing so is impossible. Bregan Darth If one or more characters are drow, Jalaxil Banre has his lieutenants, three drow gunslingers, shadow these potential new recruits while keeping a safe distance. Felrek Lafine and Kreb Maskilia watch these characters at night, and Solon Zindabras watches them during the day, doing his best to stay out of the sunlight. Drow Gunslinger Firearms aren't widely available in the north, but some members of Break and Dearth are equipped with Lantanese pistols, bullets, and packets of smoke powder. These Drow Gunslingers are expert pistoliers, as skilled with their guns as the best archers are with their bows. Felrek Lafine Felrek is a male Drow who was born female. Unhappy with the treatment of males in his society, he petitioned to join Break and Dearth. Jalaxel took a shine to Felrekt almost immediately, and the young drow has since become one of Jalaxel's most loyal lieutenants. Eager to prove himself, Felrekt is a quick volunteer for tasks and hurls himself into combat with Verve. Felrekt and Kreb Masklia are close friends and work as a team, trading banter and jokes at their enemy's expense. Felrekt lacks the cruelty common to most drow, and he won't kill an adversary unless he's left with no other choice. Game Statistics Felrek Lafine is a neutral good drow gunslinger. In addition to his weapons, he carries four packets of smoke powder and a pouch containing 20 pistol bullets. Smoke Powder Smoke powder is a magical explosive chiefly used to propel a bullet out of the barrel of a firearm. It is stored in an airtight wooden keg or tiny waterproof leather packets. A packet contains enough smoke powder for five shots 
and a keg holds enough smoke powder for 500 shots. If smoke powder is set on fire, dropped or otherwise handled roughly, it explodes and deals fire damage to each creature or object within 20 feet of it. 1d6 for a packet, or 9d6 for a keg. A successful DC-12 dexterity saving throw halves the damage. Casting Dispel Magic on Smoke Powder renders it permanently inert. Kreb Maskelier Kreb's house was destroyed long ago, leaving him with no connection to his old life in the Underdark. He is young and rash. Kreb works closely with Felrek Lafine, and the two collaborate well despite their disparate alignments. Kreb prefers to follow Felrek's lead, letting him do most of the thinking and talking. Game Statistics Kreb Masklier is a chaotic neutral drow gunslinger. In addition to his weapons, he carries four packets of smoke powder and a pouch containing 20 pistol bullets. Solon Zindabras Solon is a sadistic, fanatical bully who is fiercely loyal to Bregan Darth, and Jalaxel in particular. His younger brother, Nal, has infiltrated the Xenatha Guild. Solon considers Nal a weakling who turned to arcane magic by way of compensation, and he has never had much faith in his brother or his abilities. Solon has a burning hatred of surface elves and half-elves, having been taught from a young age to kill them as opportunity permits. When not engaged with Bregan Darth's operation, Solon spends his nights hunting the darkened streets and the alleyways of Waterdeep, looking for solitary elves or half-elves to pick off. He conceals his nighttime escapades as well as he can, but Jalaxel, Felrekt, and Crib all know what he's up to. Game Statistics Solon Zindabras is a neutral evil drow gunslinger, with these changes. Solon wields a scimitar instead of a short sword. It deals slashing damage instead of piercing damage. He wears a pair of drow-made boots of elven kind. In addition to his weapons, he carries four packets of smoke powder and a pouch containing 20 pistol bullets. Characters who have a passive wisdom perception score of 18 or higher see fleeting glimpses of the drow spies over a period of several days and can, with a successful DC-15 wisdom insight check, ascertain these spies are paying particular attention to the activities of the drow party members. Jalaxel Bunray. If the party reports the drow to the City Watch, Jalaxel ends the surveillance and breaks off all contact with the characters for the time being. On the other hand, if the characters try to confront the drow spies, they avoid contact but leave behind a black eye patch as a calling card. The next day, Jalaxel Banray shows up to the party's headquarters, using his hat of disguise to appear as a habdasher named J.B. Nevercott. In this guise, he asks to speak privately with drow characters who he thinks might make suitable Bregendurth recruits. Only drow are given serious consideration, but Jalaxel doesn't care if they're male or female. As a test, he offers them their first mission. Jalaxel is a consummate actor who never lets his guard down. Even if the characters discern his true identity, he never admits to being anything other than what he pretends to be. Jalaxel Banre Jalaxel is a flamboyant, swashbuckling drow iconoclast. He leads a renegade drow faction called Bregan Dearth, made up of disenfranchised male drow, most of them culled from destroyed or disgraced houses. Gifted with a sharp mind, a sense of humour, puissant skill with the blade, and a wealth of useful magic items, Jalaxel infiltrated the city of Luskin, brought a kind of order to its lawlessness, and declared himself its secret lord. Jalaxel likes to weave a tangled web of schemes that leaves his enemies baffled, the latest of which is a plan to legitimize Luskin by making it a member of the Lord's Alliance. The city's unsavory reputation has been thwarted by all previous efforts, and the current leaders of the Lord's Alliance have voiced their opposition to Luskin admittance. A few have flatly declared that the city will never be welcome in the Alliance. Nonetheless, Jalaxel seeks to pursue Lairul Silverhand, the open lord of Waterdeep, to champion Luskin's cause, even if it means losing other Alliance members in the process. Tying Luskin's fortune with those of Waterdeep could increase Jalaxel's political and economic power on the Sword Coast. Jalaxel has come to Waterdeep in the guise of an Aluskan human named Zardal Zord. Captain Zord is the master of the Sea Maiden's Fair, a carnival that travels up and down the Sword Coast in three ships. The Eyecatcher, 
the Heartbreaker, and the Hellraiser, all words that describe Jalaxel. He spends most of his time aboard the Eye Catcher, his personal ship. The other two vessels carry members of the Carnival and their parade wagons. Jalaxel has forged an alliance with Latan, an island to the south, and has armed his Bregan Dirth lieutenants with Lantanese firearms that rely on magical smoke powder to function. He also has acquired a Lantanese submarine called the Scarlet Marpanoth. This underwater vessel is mounted below the eye catcher and kept out of sight. Jalaxel plans on using the submarine to flee Waterdeep if his schemes unravel. Jalaxel's loyalties are to himself first and foremost, and to Bregan Dirth secondarily. Bregan Dirth's Missions Second Level Party I'd like you to steal a handkerchief from a Waterdavian noble and give it to a tiefling girl who lives in a crate at the corner of Ned Street and Dock Street by the wharf. Meeting a noble isn't hard, but snatching one's handkerchief without being detected requires a successful DC-12 dexterity sleight of hand check. One can also convince a noble to surrender it with a successful DC-12 charisma, deception, intimidation or persuasion check. The tiefling girl in the crate thanks the characters for the hanky. Reward. Each Bregan Dearth character regains one renown. Third level mission. This mission is so easy, a gang of street urchins could pull it off. I want you to deliver an expose to Gaxley Rudderbust, the publisher of the local broadsheet called the Waterdeep Wazoo, without knowing who wrote it or where it came from. You'll find his office on the corner of Imar Street and Stallion Street in the North Ward. Leave the story on his desk. Jalaxel has written an expose on devil worship among unnamed Waterdavian noble families. The story mentions orgies and secret dealings happening behind closed doors. Jalaxel never passes up a chance to rattle the nobility and sow political unrest. A character can break into Gaxley's office while it's closed, either during lunch hour or after hours. Getting in and out without being seen requires two successful DC-15 dexterity stealth checks, and getting past a locked door that requires a successful DC-10 dexterity check using thieves tools or a knock spell or similar magic. Reward. Each Bregan Darth character regains one renown. Fourth level mission. We have captured a member of the Zenitha Guild, and I'd like you to guard him for these three nights, until I or another member of Bregan Darth reclaims him. You'll find him trapped in your basement. Characters who search the basement of Trollskull Alley find Ot Steel Toes, bound by iron bands of Balaro. How he got there is anyone's guess. He doesn't even know. On the first night, Xanatha sends a gang of six bugbears to attack the tavern and rescue Ott. If the characters have moved Ott elsewhere, the bugbears attack the tavern anyway. On the second night, four members of the Dungsweepers Guild, commoners, with intellect devourers in their skulls, visit the tavern. They order drinks and scope out the tavern, attacking if they find Ott or leaving if they don't. On the third night, a beholder zombie attacks. After the third attack, Ott disappears as mysteriously as he had arrived, along with the iron bands of Bellaro. Reward. Each Bregan Dearth character gains two renown. Fifth level mission. We have a spy deep within Xanatha's organization, but I fear he is being compromised. It breaks my heart to do this, but I'm sending you to eliminate him. Make it quick and painless, and for Loth's sake, be discreet. Jalaxel identifies the traitor as a drow mage named Nal Zinderbrus, and furnishes the characters with the route to Xanatha's lair through the underground passageways. Xanatha's lair will later be described in Chapter 5, and characters who follow Jalaxel's route arrive in Area X1. Reward. Each Bregan Dearth character gains two renown, each party member who contributes to the mission receives a trophy bearing a golden statuette of Jalaxel worth 250 gold pieces. Emerald Enclave The Emerald Enclave takes an interest in characters who seek to preserve the balance within Waterdeep, particularly clerics of nature, druids and rangers. Any such character is visited by a white cat that speaks the following message in a melodious male voice. Interested in joining the Emerald Enclave? Come meet us at Polkenmere in the Southern Ward. The cat is an ordinary animal, 
upon which the animal messenger spell was cast. It dashes away after delivering its invitation. Melanor Fellbranch The character's main contact in the Emerald Enclave is Melanor Fellbranch, the friendly but humorless groundskeeper of Falconmere, a compound located one block south of Colat Towers. Falconmere is owned by Tarm and Falcon noble families. Melanor delivers missions by way of animal messenger spells, and is partial to using cats and pigeons as couriers. He quickly assigns new members their first mission. Melanor is a half-elf druid with these changes. Melanor is chaotic good. He has these racial traits. He has advantage on saving throws against being charmed, and magic can't put him to sleep. He has dark vision out to a range of 60 feet. He speaks common and elvish. Jareth Falcon When the characters arrive at Falconmere for the first time, Melanor introduces them to the lady of the estate, a noblewoman termed Demigod, and chosen of Maliki named Jareth Falcon. Jareth, the only member of her family who currently resides at Falconmere, manifests as a disembodied female voice that can be heard by anyone in the villa gardens. She offers membership in the Enclave and bestows on each new member a charm of restoration. Jareth also offers Falconmere as a safe haven for Enclave members and their friends. In her disembodied state, Jareth can't be harmed. If the need arises, Jareth can cast any spell on the druid spell list. She uses her spells in defense of her estate and its beautiful gardens. A member of the Emerald Enclave can petition Jareth to cast a spell, which she is happy to do if that character's renown in the Enclave equals or exceeds the spell level. Emerald Enclave Missions Second Level Mission Outlying farms are being terrorized by a scarecrow come to life. It has slaughtered livestock, chased horses, and spooked farmers. No people have been killed as of yet, so the city guard are dragging its heels. Something must be done. Not one, but three scarecrows are terrorizing Undercliff. One wears a sackcloth hood, another has a rotting pumpkin head, and the third is covered by a threadbare blanket. Characters who camp in a field for the better part of a day or night have a 10% chance of encountering one of the scarecrows. The attack continues until all three scarecrows are destroyed. Reward Each Emerald Enclave character gains one renown for ending the threat. Third level mission Sir Ambrose Everdorn, a grizzled old champion of Kelimbor, has offered to help the city guard catch a necromancer who's stealing bones from the city of the dead and animating them as skeletons. Sir Ambrose could use your help if you're not too busy. Convincing Ambrose Everdorn, a lawful good male human Tytherian knight, that the party intends to help requires a successful DC 13 charisma persuasion check. If the check succeeds, Sir Ambrose asks the party to patrol the southern half of the cemetery for 10 consecutive nights while he patrols the north half. The characters have a cumulative 10% chance each night of encountering six skeletons, but there's no sign of the necromancer who animated them. Once the skeletons are destroyed, no further encounters occur. After a 10 day, Sir Ambrose releases the characters from service. Reward Each Emerald Enclave character gains one renown. Each party member who patrolled the cemetery for all 10 nights receives 100 gold pieces. 4th Level Mission Doppelgangers threaten the balance of power in Waterdeep. Rumour has it that a group of them are hiding in the Yawning Portal. Root them out and rid the city of them if you can. Characters need to confront Bonnie the Doppelganger and with a successful DC 15 Charisma, Intimidation or Persuasion check, Convince her to leave Waterdeep and take her gang with her. Reward Each Emerald Enclave character gains two renown. Fifth level mission The Xanatha Guild is releasing monsters to the district of the City Watch and the City Guard while its members stir up trouble elsewhere. The authorities are having trouble catching and killing a flying horror known as a Grell. This aberration was last seen snatching up old women in the dock ward. Unless we intervene, she won't be the last. Locating the Grell requires a successful DC-18 intelligence investigation check, followed by a successful DC-18 wisdom survival check. Each check, whether successful or not, 
represents one hour of gathering information or tracking spore. In fact, there are two grells. One grell tries to flee if the other is killed. Reward. Each Emerald Enclave character gains two renown. Jereth bestows a charm of heroism on each party member who helped slay the Grells. Force Grey, or the Grey Hands, missions. The Blackstaff, Vajra Safar, is friends with Rainer Neverembra, and the word of his rescue quickly reaches her ears. She uses a sending spell to deliver the following short message to one of the characters. I am Vajra Safar, the Blackstaff. Come to Blackstaff Tower in the Castle Ward at once. Bring your friends. Despite her insistent tone, Vajra doesn't take offence if the characters refuse her invitation. A day later she casts another sending spell and reaches out to a different party member. If she is refused a second time, she doesn't contact the party again until the characters gain a level. Vajra Safar Vajra is a capable wizard in her mid-thirties the youngest person to hold the position of Blackstaff. As the High Wizard of Waterdeep, she is charged with using all the magic and resources at her disposal to defend the city against threats. She was hand-picked for the job by Kelbin Arasan and wields the Blackstaff from which Kelbin derived his name and the title of the office. Vajra isn't the city's most powerful wizard, but she can hold her own. Despite her many gifts, she still questions her ability to meet the demands of her role, and she rarely makes a decision without first soliciting advice from the Blackstaff, which contains Kelburn Arison's spirit, as well as the spirits of all other Blackstaffs who preceded her. She also gets intelligence from other sources, both through her own network of spies and from Harper agents. Vajra runs the Blackstaff Academy, a school for mages, out of Blackstaff Tower in the Castle Ward. She also is in charge of Force Grey, an order of highly skilled adventurers who are called upon to defend the city in times of need. Vajra is always looking for new adventurers to fill the ranks of Force Grey, and she is particularly interested in those who can bring unique skills, abilities or spells to the mix. Several of the older and more seasoned wizards of Waterdeep consider Vajra an upstart, but they are smart enough not to challenge her. Only the open lord, currently Lairil Silverhand, can strip Vajra of her title. Blackstaff Tower is a fortress and wizard training academy all in one. From here, Vajra Safar watches over the city and asserts herself as Blackstaff. Sending spells are her preferred way of communicating with her operatives. Vajra offers the character membership in the Grey Hands, a private security force under her command. She doles out missions designed to tax the character's resources and test their loyalty to Waterdeep. Characters who complete these missions won't gain enough renown to join Force Grey yet, but they will gain something valuable, Blackstaff's patronage. Vajra continues to take an interest in their adventuring careers, helping out when she can. Force Grey Missions Second Level Missions Seek out Halam, a monk who lives in the cave on the side of Mount Waterdeep. Ask him what he's heard about threats to the city, but try not to annoy him or overstay your welcome. Those who climb the mountainside to reach the caves must succeed on a DC-12 constitution saving throw or arrive with 1d4 levels of exhaustion. Trying to get Halam to share information requires a DC-12 charisma persuasion check. If the character succeeds, he tells the characters, Evil's twin hides its face for now. Expect that to change before the winter's end. This is an oblique reference to Manchun. The characters can descend the mountain safely. Reward. Each Grey Hand character gains one renown. Halam. This venerable monk lives in a cave halfway up the side of Mount Waterdeep. Halam is a grand master of the Order of the Even Handed, a small monastic group devoted to Tyr. Would-be students periodically visit him to learn the way of the Sacred Fists, which combines cleric magic and monk training. They usually return to the city confused, bruised, and not inclined to visit again. In times of great peril, Alarm can be called on to help. Sometimes he offers pearls of wisdom, and sometimes he descends from his cave to set things right with fisticuffs. He can show up at any point of the story as a helpful figure, and the characters can visit him in his cave if they need guidance or training. The Order of the Gauntlet considers him a staunch ally. 
Halam is immune to disease and doesn't require food or water. Though he ages, he suffers none of the frailty of old age. Third level mission. A young bronze dragon has taken up residence in Deepwater Harbor. It startled a few sailors recently, but hasn't hurt anyone. Confront the dragon and learn its intentions. Vardra gives the characters a potion of water breathing to complete this mission. They find a young bronze dragon, Zelophan, swimming around the barnacle-covered shipwreck at the bottom of the deep harbour. The friendly dragon tries to coax as much treasure as he can from the characters. Those who converse with Zelophan can make a DC-13 wisdom insight check. A successful check reveals that the dragon poses no danger to Waterdeep. If no one succeeds on the check, the dragon's true intentions can't be gleaned. Reward each Grey Hand character gains one renown. Fourth level mission. A member of Force Grey has been acting strangely of late. His name is Maloon Wardragon, and his happy-go-lucky demeanor has soured. He's been hanging around the yawning portal more than usual. Observe him for a ten day, then report back to me. Characters can befriend Maloon Wardragon, or watch him from afar. Each day at dawn, Maloon engages in telepathic contests of wills with his magic axe. Azure Edge, before leaving his room at the Yawning Portal. The axe wants a new wielder, but Maloon refuses to part with it. Characters who observe Maloon during this exchange can ascertain what's going on with a successful DC-15 Wisdom Insight check. Reward. Each Grey Hand character gains two renown. If the characters rid Maloon of the Intellect Devourer in his skull, Vardra gives the party a wand of secrets. Maloon War Dragon Maloon is a handsome, formidable warrior in his prime, who serves the goddess Timora and loves a good fight. His friends, among them Rainier Neverember and Vardra Safar, describe him as honest, optimistic, and extraordinarily lucky. Until recently, he was a member of Force Grey and reported directly to the Black Staff. In recent months, Maloon has spent much of his time at the Yawning Portal. Three months ago, out of boredom, Maloon accompanied a fledgling band of adventurers on an expedition to Undermountain. There his luck ran out. While resting in the dungeon, the adventuring party was attacked by monsters unleashed by Xanathar, including a number of intellect devourers. One of the creatures succeeded in magically devouring and replacing Maloon's brain, turning the champion of Timora into a puppet. After finishing off his unsuspecting companions, Maloon returned to Waterdeep as a Xanathar Guild spy. The intellect devourer that inhabits Maloon's skull was bred by Nilinor, a mind player in Xanathar's employ. It knows everything Maloon knew, and Maloon behaves much as he did before his descent into Undermountain. He hangs out at the Yawning Portal, tries to bond with adventurers, and offers a helping hand whenever doing so feels appropriate. The Intellect Devourer's primary goals are to steer adventurers away from Undermountain and get them to undertake quests that further the aims of Xanathar. Such quests usually involve the eradication of Xanathar's enemies, and Maloon is all too eager to fight alongside those who would fall for his ruse. Adjusted Game Statistics If Maloon is killed and raised from the dead, his true self is restored and his statistics change as follows. Maloon is neutral good. He loses his telepathy and his ability to speak and understand deep speech. He can attune to Azure Edge. Azure Edge, weapon, battle axe, legendary, requires attunement. Forged by the arch wizard Agharon, this intelligent battle axe was crafted to defend Waterdeep. Its current wielder is a former member of Force Grey named Maloon Wardragon, but the weapon is searching for a new owner. Azure Edge has a solid steel handle etched with tiny runes, wrapped in a blue dragon hide with a star sapphire set into the pommel. The axe head is forged from silver, electrum and steel alloys whose edges constantly shimmer as a deep blue luminescence. You gain a plus 3 bonus to attack and damage rolls made with this magic weapon. The shield spell provides no defense against the axe, which passes through the spell's barrier of magical force. When you hit a fiend or an undead with the axe, cold blue flames erupt from its blade and deal an extra 2d6 radiant damage to the target. Hurling. The battle axe has three charges. You can expend one charge and make a ranged attack with the axe, hurling it as if it had the thrown property and a normal range of 60 feet and a long range of 180 feet. 
Whether it hits or misses, the axe flies back to you at the end of your current turn, landing in your open hand or at your feet in your space as you choose. The axe regains all expended charges daily at dawn. Illumination. While holding the axe, you can use an action to cause the axe to glow blue or quench the glow. This glow sheds bright light in a 30-foot radius and a dim light for an additional 30 feet. Sentience. Azure Edge is a sentient, lawful neutral weapon with an intelligence of 12, wisdom of 15, and a charisma of 15. It has hearing and dark vision out to a range of 120 feet. The weapon communicates telepathically with its wielder, and can speak, read, and understand common. It has a calm, delicate voice. The weapon can sense the presence of non-lawful characters within 120 feet of it. Personality Azure Edge is sworn to protect Waterdeep, and it desires to be wielded by a law-abiding person willing to dedicate everything to the city's defense. The weapon is patient and takes its time finding its ideal wielder. If someone tries to use Azure Edge against its will, the axe can become 10 times heavier than normal and can magically adhere to any medium or larger object or surface it comes into contact with. Once it does so, the axe can't be wielded. Nothing short of a wish spell can separate the axe from the item or the surface which it adhered to without destroying one or the other, though the axe can choose to end the effect at any time. Versatile. This weapon can be used with one or two hands. A damage value in parentheses appears with the property, the damage when the weapon is used with two hands to make a melee attack. Fifth level mission. Xanathar's using intellect devourers to take control of Waterdabians in key positions throughout the city. We must deal with this problem at once, infiltrate Xanathar's lair, and destroy whatever is responsible for creating these creatures. The characters must slay Nilinor, the Mind Flayer. They can stake out Xanathar's guild hideout, as described in Chapter 1, and wait for Nilinor to show up there, or confront the Mind Flayer in Xanathar's lair, as described in Chapter 5. Reward. Each Grey Hand character gains two renown. Every character who participated in the raid receives a potion of resistance. In addition, Vardra covers the cost of any raised dead spells needed to bring back dead characters. Harpers. The Harpers approach good aligned characters who show promise as spies. One such character receives the following message written on a paper bird. Rainier tells us that you are a good bet. He bought you tickets to the opera tonight at the Lightsinger Theatre in the Sea Ward. If you are interested, meet Mert at Intermission, Private Box C. Formal attire is required for admittance. Enclosed are tickets for the entire party to The Fall of Tiamat, an opera sung in giant describing the evil dragon queen's defeat at the Well of Dragons. Mert if any characters join the Harpers, Mert becomes their main Harper contact through the adventure. Mert. Once known as Mert the Merciless and the Old Wolf, Mert made a fortune and carved out a reputation as an adventurer and philanderer. Today, an older and wiser Mert serves as one of the Masked Lords, a Harper and a close advisor to Lairil Silverhand. The years have not worn him down, and though he has grown soft in the flesh, he remains deceptively strong, vigorous, and clear of mind. Mert has survived the passings of centuries by means of magic, and of all the Masked Lords, he is least concerned with concealing his identity. Despite his prodigious girth, Mert can move with good speed when he must, and he hasn't let his adventuring skills wither. His wife, Aesper, passed away several years ago, and his rambling mansion has seen better days. Mert spends his day embroiled in politics and whiles away the nights in drink and debauchery. Treasure. Mert has access to magic items of all kinds, but keeps only a few on his person. He can equip himself with other magic items as the need arises. In addition to his other magic items, Mert owns a Lord's Ensemble, he dons the ensemble only when meeting with other masked lords in an official capacity. Lord's Ensemble, wondrous item, very rare, requires attunement by a creature with a humanoid build. 
The masked lords of Waterdeep don this ensemble when meeting with one another. This raiment renders each lord indistinguishable from the others. The ensemble consists of three pieces, a helm, an amulet, and a robe that function as a single magic item when worn together, but only within the city of Waterdeep and its sewers. You become attuned to the ensemble as a single item. Lord's Helm This bucket helm covers your head and conceals your face, screens over your eyes to help shroud your identity without blinding you. While you wear the helm, your voice is magically altered to sound genderless, and you are immune to magic that allows other creatures to read your thoughts or determine whether you are lying, to know your alignment, or to know your creature type. Creatures can communicate telepathically with you only if you allow it. Lord's Amulet This amulet bears a crest of water deep. It functions as an amulet against proof of detection and location. Lord's Robe This elegant robe functions as a ring of free action and creates the illusion that you have a nondescript androgynous human build and stand six feet tall. If any of the characters join the Harpers, Mert becomes their main Harper contact throughout the adventure. Lightsinger Theatre is a high-end establishment located in the Castle Ward. If the characters meet Mert in his private box during the opera's intermission, he describes the Harpers and offers membership to eligible characters. Characters who accept receive a silver pin of a harp with a crescent moon along with their first mission. Mert tells them if they ever need to speak with him directly, they are welcome to visit his manor in the Sea Ward. If the characters do visit Mert's manor, there's a 90% chance that Mert isn't home and no one answers the door. Harper Missions Second Level Mission One of the Dreys working in the city is pulled by a talking mare named Maxine. Locate her and find out if she's learned the identity of any of the Zent operatives, and if so, determine their whereabouts. Characters can find Maxine, a draft horse with an intelligence score of 10, with a successful DC-13 intelligence investigation check. Maxine speaks common, and characters must try to convince her that they're Harpers by making a DC-13 charisma persuasion check. If the check succeeds, the horse recalls giving a ride to a sun elf and his half-orc bodyguard two days ago. She picked them up at an intersection, she doesn't recall which one, and dropped them off at the yawning portal. They talked about hiring spies to root out Xanatha Guild hideouts in the city. Maxine's description of the passengers matched the appearance of Davil Starsong and Yagra Stonefist. Reward. Each Harper character gains one renown. Third level mission. Uza Solazef is an old woman who sells books out of a narrow three-story building on Storm Street in the Trades Ward. She claims to have trapped a monster in her shop and fears for the welfare of her books and her cat. The City Watch isn't likely to lend a hand, given Urza's propensity for tall tales, but the Harpers owe her a favour. You'll find her sobbing at Felsen's Folly, a tavern at the corner of Sorn Street and Salaba Street. Make haste! Uza, a lawful good female human Milan commoner, describes the threat as a monstrous orb of many eyes that chased her cat, Philippa, into the shop. The monster is in fact a gazer. If the characters met a gazer in chapter 1, they know what they're up against. Uza lends them the keys to the front and back doors of her shop. Characters can find the interior in shambles and hear a cat meowing on the third floor. The sounds are coming from the gazer, which is hunting Philippa. The cat has so far eluded the nasty little predator. Reward Each Harper character gains one renown if the gazer is defeated. Uza also gives the party a used spell book containing four first level and three second level wizard spells. Fourth level mission One of our members, Matram Merg, has allied himself with a gang of doppelgangers and believes the Harpers should recruit them. We need an unbiased opinion. Track down and speak with each of the doppelgangers and gauge their trustworthiness. The characters must speak with five doppelgangers, starting with their leader, Bonnie, who works at the Yawning Portal. She needs a few days to round up the other doppelgangers, who agree to meet at the tavern in human guises. 
Characters must interview each doppelganger and succeed on a DC-16 Wisdom Insight check to ascertain its trustworthiness. Only Bonnie is trustworthy. Reward. Each Harper character gains two renown. Every contributing party member receives 50 gold pieces. Fifth level mission. Lady Ramilia Haventree is hosting a party at House Ulbrinta, her villa on Del Zorn Street, located between Belzora Street and Bronda's Way in the North Ward. We have reason to suspect drow spies have infiltrated the guest list. Attend the party and root out the disguised drow. Dress sharply. Ramalia Haventree knows of the mission, but it's not revealed to the characters that she's a harper. There's one drow spy in attendance, Jalaxel Banray. He uses his hat of disguise to appear as a young actor from Luskan, named Erstian Duman. A successful DC-24 Wisdom Insight check is needed to out Jalaxel. Impressed by the perceptive adventurers, he thanks Lady Haventree for an entertaining evening and dashes off, but not without first tipping his hat to the characters, or character who exposed him. Reward Each Harper gains two renown. Every party member who attended the party receives 200 gold pieces. Romalia Haventree Romalia, Remy to her friends, is the lady of House Ulbrinta and a guiding light for the Harpers in Waterdeep. She became an active force for good in the city after assassins killed her husband, Arthgast Ulbrinter, and destroyed his remains. A sun elf, she has two children, a half-elf son named Arthas, who is studying music in Silvery Moon, and a half-elf daughter named Saranor, who lives in the Moonshay Island of Arlorn with her husband and daughter. Lady Haventree retains a handful of loyal servants and spies. Remy holds secret Harper meetings in her villa, which is watered by all manner of spells. She uses a silver raven figurine of wondrous power to deliver messages to Harper spies scattered throughout the city. The Lord's Alliance Characters who place the security of the city and the realm ahead of their own interests are invited to join this faction. Potential recruits must be residents of Waterdeep. Jalesta Silvermane the character's primary contact is Jalus de Silvermane, a field agent who reports to the open lord Lay or Silverhand. Jalus de spends much of his time in the Yawning Portal and other taverns that adventurers are known to frequent. Jalus de Silvermane An earnest man in his mid-twenties, Jalus de hails from the distant lands of Cormir, where he earned his spurs working for a mercenary company called the Steel Shadows. A few years ago, Jalister left the Dales and travelled to Waterdeep with several other members of the company, one of whom, Feral Dunblade, would become his best friend and lover. The wizard Elminster befriended the two young men and brought them to the attention of Lairil Silverhand, who put them to work as deputies and spies. Jalister and Feral helped the Open Lord expose a plot to overthrow the government, but Feral was killed while helping bring the perpetrators to justice. Jalister remained in Waterdeep afterward, becoming one of Lairil's field operatives in service of Waterdeep and the Lord's Alliance. He has been romantically unattached ever since Feyril's death, but longs again for love. Treasure Jalister carries a badge of the watch, a plus two bonus to his armor class if he's not using a shield. If the badge is lost or taken from him, he returns to Lairil Silverhand. Jalister offers membership in the Lord's Alliance to those who qualify. Members are expected to complete whatever missions are assigned to them in a timely professional manner. Refusing to accept or complete a mission can result in suspension or dismissal. An Alliance member who is suspended receives no Alliance missions until the suspension ends, while dismissal from the Alliance means a loss of membership and a loss of all the renown in the faction. Lord's Alliance Missions Second Level Mission A gang war is causing unrest through the city. We have offered protection to the members of the Dung Sweepers Guild, and you have been assigned to protect a group of them. Meet them at Mule Skull Tavern on Ship Street in the Dock Ward, at Six Bells, and guard them while they work. Do this every day for a ten day. Each morning, the characters meet with a team of four Dung Sweepers, 
commoners, and head to the trades ward, where the sweepers spend the day cleaning up waste in the streets. It's boring work. On the ninth day, around high sun, a carrion crawler emerges from a nearby alley, pursued by two city watch guards. The characters can help slay the carrion crawler, which came up from the sewers. Reward. Each Lord's Alliance character gains one renown. Third level mission. Harko Swornhold, an evil adventurer who was exiled three years ago for attempting to bribe a city magistrate, has returned to Waterdeep illegally. We think Xanathar's guild is using him to incite violence. He was last seen recruiting Kenku in the Dark Ward, find him and quietly put him to the sword. Whichever character leads the search must succeed on three DC-14 intelligence investigation checks before gaining three failures, with each check representing eight hours of investigation. Other characters can assist, granting advantage on the checks. Harko, a bandit captain, has two Kenku companions that fight by his side. Reward. Each Lord's Alliance character gains one renown. Fourth level mission. The Zents are courting a red wizard of Thay named Eslun Bazant, trying to add his gang of thugs to their ranks. All we know about him is that he fled his homeland a few years back and has been too smart to get caught doing anything illegal. He and his gang of bullies prowl the dock ward, scuttle the deal and do it fast. The characters can create a rift between the Zentarum and Eslun's gang by sowing rumours of betrayal. They must spend 25 gold pieces in bribes and succeed on a DC 16 charisma deception or persuasion check. Conversely, they can confront Elsun Bazant, a lawful evil male Thayan human mage and his gang of five thugs, and either defeat them or bribe them with at least 500 gold pieces. Reward. Each Lord's Alliance character gains two renown. The character can also deprive Eslun of his spellbook, which contains all the spells he has prepared. Fifth level mission. The City Watch is overwhelmed by the recent surge in violence and needs our help. We have reports of an assassin prowling the rooftops, picking off targets with arrows and alarming citizens. My sources say he goes to the ground somewhere near Trollskull Alley. Find him and alert the City Watch to his whereabouts and aid his arrest if you can. Don't kill him, since doing so could escalate the violence further. Whichever character leads the hunt must succeed on three DC-18 intelligence investigation checks before gaining three failures, with each check representing eight hours of investigation. Other characters can assist, granting advantage on the checks. If the search succeeds, characters corner the assassin, Zaraj the Hunter, in the greenhouse of Corellian's crown in Trollskull Alley, area T4. Zaraj surrenders to the city watch without a fight, believing that his fellow Zents will find a way to free him. Reward. Each Lord's Alliance character gains two renown. Every character who aids in Zaraj's capture receives 50 gold pieces. Zaraj the Hunter. Zaraj is a half-orc hunter who wields an oversized bow that shoots correspondingly large arrows. He is the master of assassination for the Black Network. If Zaraj sets out to kill someone, it's because one of his friends, Davil, Istrid, Schemo, or Tashlin, asked him to. The characters might become Zaraj's prey, or Zaraj might come to their aid to eliminate a common enemy. He's the strong, silent type. The City Watch has received reports of a figure who haunts rooftops of Waterdeep, a hulking shadow that glares from its perch, rains down death in the form of long black arrows, and slinks off with as much as a whisper. Where he comes from, if he even has a home, remains a mystery, as does the question of where he might show up next. Treasure Giraj wears a plus two leather armor and carries an oversized longbow. This unique weapon can be used only by a medium or larger creature that has a strength of 18 or higher. 
The bow shoots oversized arrows that deal piercing damage equal to 2d6 plus the wielder's strength modifier. Its range is the same as an ordinary longbow. Order of the Gauntlet The Order of the Gauntlet looks for members who seek to fight evil in all its forms. Adventurers who worship Helm, Torm, or Tyr are especially sought after. Sabra Belebranta If the party includes one or more likely recruits, Sabra Belebranta, a neutral good female Tytherian human knight, visits the characters' residences and invites them to the Halls of Justice, the Temple of Tyr, located west of the market in the Castle Ward, where they can be sworn into the Order. The swearing-in ceremony involves the recantation of an oath to find and destroy evil in all its forms. The oath is spoken while every candidate wears a silver gauntlet, a symbol of the Order. After the ceremony, Savra gives new recruits their first mission. The Bella Brantas are a Waterdavian noble family that raises griffins for the Griffin Calvary. Savra is trying to regain her honour by serving Tyr, thus atoning for the evil act she committed as a member of the evil elemental cult called the Harrowing Hatred. Savra's sins are irrelevant to this adventure, but you can learn more about her past in The Prince of the Apocalypse. Whenever she has a mission for the characters, she communicates the mission to them herself. Order of the Gauntlet Missions Second Level Mission we hear that the Zents are paying gangs in the field ward to attack suspected Xenatha guild members. Fights are breaking out in the wards daily. Stop a fight before it happens. We need to send a message to these thugs that further altercations won't be tolerated. The characters must visit the field ward and, as a fight threatens to break out, make three successful DC-12 Charisma Intimidation checks before failing three checks or else defeat four thugs, preferably without killing them, to disperse the would-be brawlers. Reward. Each Order of the Gauntlet character gains one renown. Third level mission. A notorious thief called the Black Viper, long thought dead, has apparently returned to Waterdeep. She has already robbed at least a dozen noble estates. No one knows her identity because she wears a mask but it was reported in the Waterdeep Wazoo that she's a noble. Find out what else the Broadsheets publisher knows about her and report back to me. The characters can meet with Glaxy Rudderbust, a neutral male Aluskan human commoner, the publisher of the Waterdeep Wazoo, and either succeed on a DC-12 charisma, intimidation or persuasion check, or bribe him with at least 50 gold pieces. If they do so, Gaxley shares his suspicion that the Black Viper is the secret evil twin sister of Amalia Casalanta, and that she wears a mask to hide a disfigurement. Interviewing the Casalantas at their villa, as described in Chapter 6, or conducting a day-long investigation and succeeding on a DC-15 intelligence investigation check, reveals that no such person exists. Reward each Order of the Gauntlet character gains one renown for reporting what Gaxley said. Fourth Level Mission Guards at the Endshift Tavern, located on Endshift Street in the Field Ward, are being robbed nightly, and the innkeeper says he's seen giant rats prowling around the back alleys. Sounds dull, but it's a plea for help we can't ignore. The inn is being harassed by the Shard Shunners, a gang of halfling were-rats, because the innkeeper's guard once threatened a gang member. To end the harassment, the characters must defeat three were-rats, or scare them off with a successful DC-17 Charisma Intimidation check. Reward. Each Order of the Gauntlet character gains two renown, and receives a potion of healing. Fifth Level Mission. I just received a report that spine devils are terrorizing the citizens in Twelve Dog Court in the Field Ward. Come, let us slay them together and find their evil summoner. The characters must help Savra defeat five spine devils, which have locals pinned down in a nearby building. Right after, Gaishia Omfries, a lawful evil female Tytherian human cult fanatic, emerges from an alley and attacks Savra. Kashir is an overzealous member of a devil-worshipping cult led by Victoro Casalanta. 
Savra tries to subdue and question her, but only magical compulsion can force her to implicate Victoro. Since devil worship isn't illegal in Waterdeep, Savra has no grounds to stir up trouble with the Castellantas, and she advises characters not to do so. Reward Each Order of the Gauntlet character receives two renown. Every character who took part receives a potion of greater healing. Amalia Casalanta The vainglorious lady of House Casalanta is schooled in the arcane arts. Like her husband, Victoro, she worships Asmodeus. When they were young, Amalia and Victoro signed a contract with the Archdevil, trading the souls of their children for power, good health, and long life. The soul of Osvaldo, their eldest son, was taken immediately, and he was transformed into a chain devil. The soul of the younger twins, Teresino and Elrazina, will be taken when they turn nine years old. A provision in the contract allows the Casalantas to buy their way out of it, but doing so requires a tremendous amount of coin, and a mass sacrifice of unfortunate people. While Victoro hunts for Degolt Neverember's lost cache of gold, Amalia makes plans to host a poisoned feast in celebration of Founder's Day. Amalia is well-mannered, well-read, well-traveled, and exceptionally shrewd. She is known for driving a hard bargain. Her hobby is leptodopterology, and her estate has the most beautiful butterfly garden. She allows her youngest children to play in the garden under her supervision. Victoro Casalanta, the lord of House Casalanta, is a devilishly handsome half-elf who likes coin and power. He and his wife gained both by cutting a deal with Asmodeus, which involved trading away the souls of their three children. Victoro is a priest of Asmodeus, though his devotion to the lord of nine hells is a secret known to only his wife and his closest friends. Most Waterdavians know him as a successful banker, philanthropist, and worshipper of Lathander. Some of his business profits go towards feeding and sheltering the poor, but behind this veneer of generosity, Victoro is a self-serving beast. The soul of Victoro's eldest son, Osvaldo, is forever lost and can't be saved. To allay his guilt, Victoro has forged a plan to win back the souls of his young twins, Terenzo and Elzarina. Under the terms of the contract, their souls will be forfeit on their ninth birthdays, and that day is fast approaching. But Victoro can buy his way out of the obligation by providing, as the contract states, one shy of a million gold coins and the sacrifice of one shy of a hundred unfortunate souls. Victoro is well-schooled, suave, slow to anger, and blessed with good health, long life, and immunity to disease. He dresses in the latest fashions, and walks with a ruby-tipped cane, though not because he needs to. This cane has the magical properties of a rod of rulership. Zentarum The Doom Raiders try to contact evil-aligned or morally ambiguous characters. A flying snake with the parchment tied around its body visits one character in the dead of night. The message reads, Want to be part of something big? Speak to Davil Starsong at the Yawning Portal. If the characters seek out Dabble, Yagra Stonefist greets them and leads the interested parties to a table in the centre of the Yawning Portal's taproom, where her boss waits with a drink in hand. Dabble Starsong Dabble Starsong is the character's primary contact in the Black Network, at least initially. Over drinks he shares the following information. Dabble is a retired adventurer. He and his adventuring companions joined the Zentarum a few years back. They help people in need. More specifically, they provide loans, mercenaries, and other services. Another Black Network gang has recently infiltrated the city and tried to take over the Xanatha Guild. They failed, setting off a war in the streets. Davil and his colleagues want to end the violence and restore the peace. Davil Star Song Within the Waterdeep Division of the Black Network, Davil is accorded the title of Master of Opportunities and Negotiations, because he's good at sniffing out lucrative business deals, and he makes friends easily. Like many Sun Elves, Davil has an affinity for magic, and is gifted with the kind of patience that only comes with a long lifespan. Unlike most, he's not the least bit pretentious or aloof. He keeps a room at the Yawning Portal, 
and does all his business in the establishment's tap room. He negotiates deals with grace and aplomb, even while drunk, and uses an elven loot as a spellcasting focus. Davil can put the characters in contact with the other leaders of the Black Network's Waterdeep division, namely Istrid Horn if they need a loan, Schemo Weirdbottle if they need magic, Tashlin Yafira if they need weapons or mercenaries, and Zaraj the Hunter if they need a highly skilled assassin. Davil offers membership in the faction to interested characters, then assigns them their first mission. Subsequent mission briefings are written on scrolls and delivered by flying snakes. Tashlin Yafira After the characters complete two missions for Davil, he is arrested by the City Watch and held in Castle Waterdeep, while he waits to be questioned by the Lords of Waterdeep about the Black Network's operations in the city. The characters continue to receive missions, but they come from Tashlin Yafira. Characters first become aware of the change when they receive their next mission briefing, since it's written in a different hand. Tashlin Yafira Tashlin is a master of arms and mercenaries for the Waterdeep Zentarum. In this role, she provides armor, weapons, and training to sell swords on the Black Network's payroll. Tashlin has established a useful cover by serving as a bodyguard to Veronda Levelstone, a dwarf magister stationed at the South Gate. She likes the dwarf and has earned his confidence, allowing her to reach the rank of captain in the city guard. In that position, she watches over traffic that passes through the gate and ensures that her associates in the Black Network can come and go freely. Born to a well-off family in Kalancharm, Tashlin has an unfettered sense of superiority. Quick to anger, she hates to back down from a fight. She respects anyone who can best her in melee combat. If the characters want to speak with Tashlin directly, Yagra can arrange a meeting in the City of the Dead or some other quiet place. By the time the characters see her, Tashlin has learned the following information. The rumoured leader of the renegade Zent faction is Erstel Floxen, a known Black Network assassin. A warrant has been issued for Erstel's arrest, but his current whereabouts are unknown. Even magical scrying has failed to reveal his location. The botched kidnapping of Rainy Neverembra won't sit well with Erstel. He might try again. Tushlin doesn't actually believe this, but she knows that Rainy has ties to the Harpers and might share information of interest with the characters. Weeks after his arrest, Davil is released from custody once the Lords of Waterdeep are satisfied that neither he nor his associates are responsible for the recent violence. Zent Missions Second Level Mission Someone is killing off sailors down at the Dock Ward. Three dead so far, each one decapitated by a blade in the dead of night. Look into it, will ya? Methinks the City Watch could use some help. Characters who spend three consecutive nights loitering around the docks spot Heldar, a drunk half-elf sailor, bandit, leaving the Mule Skull Tavern on Ship Street in the Dock Ward. Characters who follow Heldar can save him from Solon Zindabras, a renegade drow gunslinger. Solon hides in the shadows, blades drawn, waiting for the half-elf to stumble by. Spotting him before he strikes requires a successful DC-18 wisdom perception check. Solon flees if reduced to half his hit points or fewer. Reward Each Zentarum character gains one renown. If Helda survives Solon's attack, each character receives 50 gold pieces. Third level mission there's a shop in the trades ward called Weird Bottles Concoctions. The gnome who runs it is a friend of ours named Schemo. He's made some potions of mind reading for a client. Pick up the potions and deliver them to the Godcatcher, one of the enormous statues in the castle wards. Give the potions to the lady in the purple cloak and keep the tip. Schemo Weird Bottle has placed four potions of poison in a small silk lined coffer. The potions look, smell, and taste like potions of mind reading. Awaiting delivery near the god catcher is a Vele Rosna, the Black Viper. She wears a hooded purple cloak and is seated in the back of a hire coach. She exchanges the coffer for a black velvet pouch, then orders her driver to depart. The coach delivers Esvel to her estate in the Sea Ward. Reward Each Zemtarum character gains one renown. Esvel's pouch contains 15 platinum pieces, which the characters can keep. 
Schemo Weird Bottle. Schemo became the master of magic for the Black Network in Waterdeep, setting up a cover for the trades ward in the form of a cramped little shop called Weird Bottle's Concoctions. Most of his potions and elixirs are non magical, but he crafts magical ones for his Zent friends. Schemo can add sellout to his credentials, his services having been bought by House Grahund and the Black Network's operatives loyal to Manchun. The Rock Gnome uses paper birds to send messages both to his new friends and his old ones. Fourth level mission Waterdeep's richest halfling family, the Snow Beetles, is offering 500 gold pieces for information, leading to the safe return of a missing family member named Dasha Snow Beetle. Those dragons sure would look good in our coffers. Investigate and see what you can learn, but don't get in any trouble. The City Watch already has it out for us. Any character who spends at least three days asking pertinent questions and pursuing leads in the Southern Ward or the Dock Ward can, at any time, make a DC-18 Charisma Persuasion or Intimidation check. On a success, the character convinces some tight-lipped halflings to arrange a meeting with Dasha. The meeting is scheduled to occur at High Sun in Weymouth the next day. Dasha shows up to hear what the characters have to say, but he has no intention of going home. He recently joined a gang of halfling were-rats called the Shard Shunners, so named because they detest silver, and has since become a were-rat himself. The Shard Shunners are his family now. Reward. Each Zentarum character gains two renown. Fifth level mission. Schemo Weird Bottle has betrayed us! The little worm has been feeding information to our enemies. He must be eliminated. Make it look like an accident. Schemo Weird Bottle manages to stay one step ahead of the characters. As they approach his shop, they see him ride off on a dray with five other passengers and a driver, all commoners. If Schemo realizes he's been followed, he casts Fly and takes to the air. If the effect is dispelled or the characters maintain pursuit, he casts greater invisibility on himself and uses crowds to cover his escape. If the characters fail to nab him, he takes refuge in Colat Towers. Reward. Each Centaurum character gains two renown if Schemo is eliminated without implicating the Black Network. In addition, characters who snatch Schemo's satchel find that it holds his spellbook, containing all the spells he has prepared, a potion of mind reading, and 150 gold pieces in a silk coin purse. Open for business? If the characters intend to fix up and reopen the tavern in Trollskull Alley, they can expect to deal with various guilds, without whose support the business is likely to fail. Repairs to the walls and roof require the approval and oversight of the Carpenters, Roofers and Plasterers Guild. The Cellarers and Plumbers Guild is best equipped to handle the refurbishing of the basement and plumbing. Clean bedsheets are provided by the Launderers Guild. The streets around the establishment are kept up by the Dung Sweepers Guild and the loyal order of street labourers. Meat must come from the Guild of Butchers. Ale and wine from the Vinters Distillers and Brewers Guild, and bread and pastry from the Bakers Guild. The list goes on. The Tavern Keeping Expenses sidebar lists the costs that the characters must pay to get their place ready for business, as well as the reoccurring obligation they must meet while the tavern is open for business. Tavern Keeping Expenses This sidebar summarises the one-time payment and continuing expenses associated with running the tavern in Trollskull Alley, as well as providing rules for determining how much coin the business makes or loses. One-time expenses 1,000 gold pieces to renovate the tavern over 12 days. 250 gold pieces for guild licenses and contracts paid up front. Regular expenses 50 gold pieces per 10 day for maintenance and wages of hirelings. 10 gold pieces per 10 day for all other guild expenses. Profit or loss. At the end of every 10 day, roll a D100 plus 10 and consult the running a business table in Chapter 6 of the Dungeon Master's Guide to determine whether the tavern lost money or earned profit. Running a business. 
Adventurers can end up owning businesses that have nothing to do with delving into dungeons or saving the world. A character might inherit a smithy, or the party might be given a parcel of farmland, or a tavern as a reward. If they hold on to the business, they might feel obliged to spend time between adventures maintaining the venue and making sure it runs smoothly. A character rolls percentile dice and adds the number of days spent on this downtime activity with a maximum of 30, then compares the total to the running a business table to determine what happens. If the character is required to pay a cost as a result of rolling on this table, but fails to do so, the business begins to fail. For each unpaid debt incurred in this manner, the character takes a negative 10 penalty to subsequent rolls made on this table. If the characters spend coin on promoting their business during that 10 day, add one to the roll for each one gold piece they spent. If the characters have unpaid expenses, subtract one from the roll for each one gold piece they owe. Sample Guild Representatives Once it becomes known around the city that the tavern in Trollskull Alley is planning to reopen its doors to the public, the adventurers receive visits from guild representatives interested in the tavern's welfare. This section describes a handful of these representatives. Broxley Fair Kettle, Fellowship of the Innkeepers. Broxley, a lawful good male strongheart halfling commoner, is a laid-back law-abiding halfling with mutton chops and bushy eyebrows. Inns and taverns are few and far between in the North Ward, so he makes frequent visits to the character's place to see how it's doing and to offer his well wishes. If none of the characters are members of the guild, he strongly urges them to join to avoid further harassment. The cost of membership in the Fellowship of Innkeepers is included in the regular expenses outlined in the Tavern Keeping Expenses sidebar. Broxley has long believed the tavern to be haunted and is glad to see living souls in it once more. While lamenting the burdens of being a father of nine, he is quick to point out that the character's continued compliance with the guild rules and regulations makes his rather difficult life just a bitty bit easier. Hammond Craddock Vinter's Distillers and Brewers Guild Hammond, a neutral male Aluskan human commoner, doesn't like adventurers, but he likes their coin. This effete, well-dressed man is always seen in the company of a young scribe, Ginny, a neutral good female tiefling commoner, who wears spectacles and silently records notes and conversations in a small book as Hammond speaks. Hammond likes to stop by in the middle of the month to inform the characters of new spirits that the guild has to offer, and to give them a list of which ones to push hard. To test the extent of their willingness to cooperate, he chastises them for their current selection of beverages, even if he previously sold them those goods. Justin Rask, Guild of Butchers Dead-eyed, slack-jawed Justin, a neutral evil male Aluskan human thug, grew up in the toughest neighbourhood in the field ward and has the scars to prove it. The guild doesn't pay him enough to afford the residence in the north ward, and going to that part of the city fills his heart with resentment. He darkens the character's doorstop once a month to deliver a cartload of chopped meat for the tavern's larder. Although delivery fees are covered by the guild's monthly dues, Justin always demands some extra coin for his service. If the characters don't give him a gratuity of at least three gold pieces, he says, Maybe next time the meat will be someone you know. He lets the threat hang in the air, then departs. Ulcoria Stone Marrow, Watchful Order of the Magist and Protectors Ulcoria, a neutral good female shield dwarf archmage, has defended Waterdeep with her magic more times than she can recall. She's known as the Gargoyle because her face is frozen in a scowl that frightens adults and children alike. No one knows where she lives, but it's believed to be underground, possibly in a cellar or dungeon under one of the city's oldest estates. She uses teleport spells to enter and leave her home, and she's never seen without her shield guardian close by. A little-known fact is that Okoria once owned the tavern in Trollskull Alley. She sold it to a family of shield dwarves who fell on hard times and sold it to a woman who turned it into an orphanage. Turned out to be a hag who was cooking and eating the children, Okoria recalls. The estate passed through several more hands in the years that followed. 
Ulcoria hopes the new owners make something good of it. Any time she passes through the North Ward, Ulcoria stops by the tavern for a drink and to check out the place while her shield guardian waits outside. If she doesn't like what the characters have done to the establishment, she keeps her criticisms to herself. The characters can hire her to cast Glyph of Warding on the place, for which she charges 300 gold pieces apiece. Business Rival Emek Fern Emek Fern is a salty northerner, neutral evil male Aluskan commoner, recently tried to buy the tavern in Trollskull Alley, but was outbid by Volotham Gadam. Stung by the loss, he bought a smaller, less impressive building in the same alley and turned it into a pub, which he calls Fruin's Bruise. If you decide to introduce Emek as a business rival, choose an unmarked building on the map to serve as the pub. Emek's family migrated to Waterdeep after its holdings in Neverwinter were destroyed by the eruption of Mount Hottenau in 1451 DR. The family struggled to make ends meet by tanning leather in the trades ward. After Emek's parents died, his sister took over the business and bought him out. He never liked the work anyway, and he particularly hated dealing with the League of Skinners and Tanners. Emek is on shaky financial footing because he has sunk most of his wealth into this latest endeavour. He's also in trouble with two of the guilds. First, he tried to save coin by fixing the roof himself in defiance of the Carpenters, Roofers and Plasterers Guild. Then he offended a member of the Cellarers and Plumberers Guild by comparing the dwarf's beard to barnacles on a ship. Goals Emek wants his pub to be the most successful tavern in the North Ward, and he wants the character's business to fail spectacularly. Assets Emek is stingy when it comes to certain kinds of expenses, and foolish with his coin in other ways. He tends to spend a lot on big showy items and cut corners on the little amenities. Because he doesn't have much coin to throw around right now, his plan to ruin the character's establishment begins with borrowing some money. Plans Emek secures a 150 gold piece loan from Istrid Horn. He spends 50 gold pieces for the services of the Shard Shunners, a gang of halfling were-rats with which he has had nefarious dealings with in the past. He pays the halflings to hinder the character's efforts while he works feverishly to manage his own business. Four gang members have been assigned to work with Emek, two males named Keslo Fiddlewick and Dasher Snowbeetle, and two females named Dankia Fiddlewick, Keslo's younger sister, and Bryn Hilltopple. These halflings are were-rats with these changes. Each were-rat is small and has 27 or 66 plus 6 hit points. It has these racial traits. It can move through the space of a medium or larger creature. It has advantage on saving throws against being frightened. It can speak common and halfling. It knows thieves can't. Istrid Horn Istrid is regarded as the Black Network's master of trade and coin in Waterdeep. The Shield Dwarf operates an illegal lending operation out of a heavily guarded warehouse in the Dock Ward, offering loans to those in need of coin. Her interest rates are comparable to those of her competitors, including noble families of bankers such as the Casalantas and the Eiling Stars, but the penalties for not paying back Istrid's loans are severe. Istrid worships Vergadon, the dwarven god of wealth and luck. She likes to have others indebted to her, and she employs thugs and enforcers to collect her loans. If those resources prove inadequate, Istrid can call on her old adventuring companions for assistance. Emek's strategy for ruining the competition and the consequences for putting it into action are summarized here. The were-rats scope out the character's tavern in halfling form and might try to get jobs there. The were-rats plant morsels of food inside the character's place and bore tiny holes in the outside walls to attract rats, creating an infestation. Emek spreads rumors that the character's tavern is rat-infested, which is why he didn't buy it. Apply a negative 10 penalty on the next three rolls the characters make on the running a business table. The Shard Shunners claim they've done enough for their coin and demand more. Emek pays the were-rats another 50 gold pieces to creep around the character's tavern at night in hybrid and rat form, carve rat faces in the doors of neighborhoods and otherwise draw attention to themselves. 
Emmett convinces several local residents to sign a letter that he has drafted, then dispatches it to the city watch. The letter accuses the characters of running a front for a guild of wear at thieves and urges the watch to close their establishment. Level Advancement In this section of the adventure, the characters should advance to third level by engaging in faction missions, dealing with Emic Froon, or partaking in self-directed activities. This period of time represents an opportunity for the characters to make friends and gain a reputation for good or ill in Trollskull Alley and in Waterdeep itself before the events of Chapter 3 embroil them in a greater plot.